For the last time, let's go to Uncle Obadiah. You know where he is? It's in the Bible. Verse 21. That's where we've been for a long time. And saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. And the kingdom shall be the Lord's. And saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. And the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Help me turn to your neighbor. Neighbor. Who are you? A Jonah. Ask them. A Jonah. You know who Jonah is? Neighbor. Neighbor, who are you? A Jonah? That's the question I have for you to answer today. You need to answer that question. I know some of you are not repeating after me. Mm -hmm. It's okay, but just to get you into it. That's the question I want you to answer. You need to identify yourself. When God appoints a man to carry out an assignment, the life of that man is faced with the option of either obeying and then enter into honor or to disobey and enter into dishonor. Now, The problem is when you enter into this honor with God, you enter into this honor with man. And when you enter into honor with God, you enter into honor with man. He who is honorable with God becomes honorable with man. Amen? It's automatic. He who is dishonorable with God will be dishonorable with man. This is one of the lessons the life of Jonah exemplifies. And we're going to be looking at the life of Jonah this morning as we draw out nuggets of wisdom that the Lord has brought to us in the light of our theme for this month. Jonah is one of the minor prophets in the Bible. And There are four chapters in the book. And we're just going to rush through them for you to get some little nuggets here and there. That will help you make up your mind whether you want to abdicate the appointment God has placed upon you. The assignment God has placed in your hands. Or you want to stand up, rise up and go get it done. You want to be able to choose by reason of these nuggets of wisdom that we shall be drawing out from this prophet of God. Whether you want to enter into honor with God and consequently with men. Or you want to enter into dishonor with God and consequently with men. The choice is yours. That is why I ask you who are you? Jonah, you've got to answer that question for yourself. Amen? In Jonah chapter 1 verse 2, we find the appointment. Uh, On Wednesday, I mentioned the fact that we all are appointed by God to to do the work of an evangelist. When we began this month, I mentioned that there is a mandate, there is an obligation upon us to bear fruit to God or for God. The Lord taught us the parable.
example of the husband man. He planted the vineyard, gave it to people to keep. He was going on a long vacation. Praise the Lord. By the time it was a harvest time, he sent messengers to them. How many of us remember that? Go, those people must have harvested my farm now. They must give you the profits that are due to me. The gods, those servants, one after the other, and had them what? Thoroughly beaten. By doing so, they were sending a message to him that, listen, we are not here for you. We are here for ourselves. And every day, as I look through Christianity, as I look through this church, as I look through people who are close to me, I have come to discover that it's more a selfish thing. We are all in it as it were for ourselves, not for the Lord. And that's why we will do the things we want to do in spite of what the word of God says. We will do the things we want to do in spite of what, what the Lord is saying to us away from his written word, but in our hearts. So that many of us are no longer listening to the leading of the Holy Spirit, to the convictions of the Holy Spirit, and we have quenched the Holy Spirit in our hearts. The talking, you know, sometimes as a Christian, you want to do something that is inconvenient, something that is ungodly, that is a talk in your heart. How many of us know what I'm talking about? You know the Holy Spirit is talking to you. You cannot do this. This is wrong. This is wrong. After a while, he keeps quiet. And many of us in the church are at that point. Because we have so quenched the spirit. He no longer wants to talk to us anymore. And they were saying to the master. Do we live for you here? We live for ourselves. We're in these things for ourselves. So don't come troubling us with your thing. Every profit we make here is for ourselves. It got so bad. He said, all right, all right. Maybe they don't believe in my messengers that I've been sending. Let me send my son. When they saw the son coming, they celebrated. Now, the hare himself is coming. He owns all of this. And we are going to take him out. So that this will be perpetually ours. Listen to me. No matter how long you live, 160 years, 100, 200 years upon the face of the earth, the earth does not belong to you. Because even though God has given the earth to us, it's for an appointed time. After your days here are over, you shall report before him to give account as to what you have done with the earth and the time on the earth he gave to you. So it's going to be terrible if you appear before him empty handed because he has said so before he said no man must appear before me empty handed and we think that it's only coming to church you know, of course pastors we like to preach that that when you're coming to church you don't come empty handed because nobody must appear before the lord empty handed but listen it's, it has an eternal dimension the eternal dimension is that when life here is over nobody that belongs to him must appear empty handed before him. You must come with profit. Are you ready? Appointment. Appointment. Arise, he said to Jonah, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it for their wickedness is come up before me. Now, one of the first things I want to bring to your attention is the fact that, hey, God does not consult with you before appointing you to an assignment. He does not consult with you. You know, the problem between man and God from inception has been that I am my person. I want to be independent of you. I don't want to be subjected to you. I don't want to be subservient to you. I am man. I want to be me. Now, that's okay if you are talking to your fellow man. 
But it's not okay when you're talking to God. When, when you think that you can be independent, many of us, oh God, help us. We are in those throes where we think that it's by power, it's by might, we can get it done, we can achieve anything. Let me tell you, even the best of men know to rely either on God or on the devil to get by. You cannot live independent of God if you're a child of God. So when he appoints you to an assignment, take it serious. Praise God. Take that assignment what? Because he knows your end from before your beginning. He does not have to consult you. Well, I have my time. I need to do what I have to do. This is not my thing. No, no, no. It's wrong talk. It's wrong talk. And wrong talk concerning God is rotting talk. Does you no good. So, he appoints you. And what he requires of you is to accept the appointment willingly. Why am I asking you to accept the appointment willingly? It is the level of success achieved in the performance of each such given assignment. If such God-given assignment that determines the success or otherwise of any particular life. Can I take that one more time? It is the level of success achieved in the performance of each such God-given assignment that determines the success or otherwise of any particular life. How well your life goes. Not you upon the face of the earth because hey, you could be doing something and making billions of it. It doesn't necessarily mean that that is the assignment God has given to you. But when you do well in any God-given assignment, and you know, I was thinking about it this morning. Many of us are saying, last month, we, it was the month of purpose in this place. Praise God. And many people during the question and answer time indicated that they are confused as to their purpose. It was as I began to meditate on this that it became clear to me that you know, the place to start is to start from the known to the unknown. Is that how they do that? They do it in which, which area of Marx is that? Is it algebra? Come on now, someone talk to me, mathematician. I'm a lawyer. In fact, one of the reasons I went to read law is because I can't stand Marx. Huh? Listen. As you start from the known. The known is what he has already written in the Bible for us. He says, do the work of an evangelist. What is the work of an evangelist? Win souls. He says, he that winneth a soul is wise. That's, it's not, you don't have to pray to get that one. It's in the Bible. He says, I have called you and ordained you that you may bear fruit and that your fruit may abide. Is it in the Bible? I just quoted scripture now. So you don't need to go far. Just start from where you know. What you know. Written in the word. And as you do that, and you're faithful in it, God is bound, he's obligated to lead you to your specific purpose hello so you cannot say ah, i don't know my purpose no start with what assignment god is giving to you that is clear and then go to the unknown he will reveal it to you hallelujah many there are in life and sadly so in the church of those who are at 
assignments that are not God given. It's a sad story. Because every assignment that is not God given that you perform has no eternal consequence. Second nugget we want to get from the life of Jonah. Now, I, I, I need to let those who don't know about Uncle Jonah just a little brief bring you in. Jonah, as God's prophet, was given an assignment. God didn't consult with him. Jonah, go to Nineveh. Now, who are the people of Nineveh? These people were enemies of the Jews. Terrible fellows that oppressed them. Nineveh is one of the major cities in the nation called Assyria. They were totally opposed to the Jews. They will raid them, they will oppress them, they will afflict them again and again and again. So Jonah, as a Jew, was naturally averse to the people of Nineveh. Praise God. Then he was in his closet when God told him, go, their wickedness has become too much for me and I'm going to deal with them. Jonah said, wow. Praise God. God, you want to deal with my enemies and you're sending me to them? Forget it. In verse 3, chapter 1, verse 3, Jonah didn't even answer God one bit. He just packed his things carried money, went to the marine and just joined a ship. Let me leave this place. So let him look for me. When he didn't find me, he will know that I'm not ready for this assignment. So Jonah became an Andrew. Out of the nation of Israel, he ran away from God. Praise the Lord. That was the short, that's the short story that's that's the story jonah ran away but the second nugget i want to bring is that your assignment is clear when you read and study the book of jonah you will discover that in the life of jonah the assignment and what god does for one he does for all jonah's assignment was very clear he says go to nineveh that great city and cry against it full stop listen to me child of god God's assignment never leaves you in confusion. It is always clear. Anything you are willingly doing that does not bring you fulfillment is not an assignment from God. Because the willing performance of your assignment from God comes with it a sense of fulfillment. Someone say amen. Every God-given assignment has in it a redemptive dimension. Even if it may not appear so at the beginning, but once you begin to perform it, it brings you a sense of fulfillment because now you are touching another life. You are being an instrument in the hands of God to impact another life positively. That's what... God-given assignments do. You may not see it in a religious point of view. You are just doing something, but you will discover that what you are doing has such a positive impact on people. And if you are spiritually sensitive, the window will open for you to have them brought in as sons and daughters for God. Because when a man knows you care, hello, they'll follow you. They'll follow you. Jonah was never confused. So if you're confused right now about why we are making so much fuss about you going out there and discharging the assignment God has placed upon you, then you need to know 
and ask again, is this God's given assignment? Number three, there are dangers for non-compliance. Jonah chapter 1 verse 3 tells us that Jonah declined his appointment. Praise the Lord. I mentioned that he ran away. He ran away. The first consequence is that it leads to your inability to abide in or even face the presence of God. Jonah, when he ran away, could not... I mean, he was running away from the presence of God. Is someone hear what I'm saying? Now, what, what is pastor talking about? Evangelism. What has that got to do with the presence of God? It is... Staying in the presence of God that brings the burdens of God upon your heart. It is staying in the presence of God that makes you to be at one with God. It makes you stand on holy ground with God. So the pressures of God become your pressures. The challenges of God become your challenges. And I know some people are thinking, does God have pressures? Hello? What are you talking about? Does God have challenges? What are you talking about? In fact, that you are recalcitrant in walking with him is one of his troubles. So God has troubles. Your disobedience is an issue with God. And let me tell you, for some of us that are carrying serious destinies, because of your disobedience, God wakes up intercessors to pray for you. To tell you how that that is a problem to God. Some of us that are carrying serious destinies that are multidimensional, God raises intercessors to pray for you. Because your lifestyle is a problem to him. Leave you the way you're going, you wreck his idea for you. You wreck his purpose for you. So he gets intercessors. Now there are people like you who have great destinies, who are under the clutches of the devil. It's a great challenge for God to bring them to his light. So what happens? He is relying on you. That's why he has raised you as a savior upon Mount Zion. That you can go up there and reach them for him. When you do so, you solve God's problem. Now, flip it over. He who solves God's problem, what will God do to them? He says he will lend to the poor. Lends unto who? You see the mathematics, how it works. The poor is one of God's problems. So if you help him solve the problem of the poor, God solves your problem because he becomes a debtor to you and God cannot owe. I'm, I, I, is, is, is it making sense to you? Hallelujah! So beloved, it's, it's serious that we understand this. It's key. God has issues. He has difficulties with men, with his children, with you and I. I'm an intercessor by calling. My first calling is intercession. There have been many times in the middle of the night that God wakes me up and I say, Lord, I want to sleep. Don't want to pray. Yeah, my wife can tell you. I want to sleep. And I just purposely refuse God. Oh yeah, he deals with me. Yeah, he deals with me. It's not, you know, when you disobey, your father will deal with you. Is that not so? That sleep, I will sleep. Terrible dreams. <laughs> ah, ter horrible dreams. Horrible. I, I wake up. Ah. Blood of Jesus. Now I began to pray. He's a foolish boy. <laughs> I told you to wake up to pray all night. You won't now. You're praying by force. We are, a, we, are, we are an issue to God. And there are so many issues, troubles that God has to contend with. So he has raised us up. Particularly as it affects unbelievers. Which, you know, whose lives he had planned great exploits. They must come into the light. They must come into understanding. They must come into be empowered. They must come in. They have been earmarked for great. And you know. The, the thing is, it's an honor, because I need to bring this in. It's an honor for God to rely on you to achieve his purpose in the life of another. Because if you fail, and when you fail, hello, 
If you fail, and when you fail to allow God to use you to accomplish his purpose in another life, he sets you aside and raises someone else. God is never closed up of options. He has several options. So for God, looking at the various options he has to choose me and you to do something for him, isn't that an honor? It's a great privilege. Now when we think in this light, we will not hesitate. We will not hesitate. The, the, the scorn that we will suffer from them, the um, nonchalant attitude that they will throw at us in our trying to reach them, is nothing compared to the honor that God has placed upon you in calling upon you in spite of the millions of options he has to do his work. It's a great privilege. Praise the Lord. Praise, praise the Lord. Danger for non-compliance. You are unable to face his presence. You are unable to abide where? In his presence. And what is your life without the presence of God? This message is, is something I need you to think along with me. What is your life without the presence of God? Listen to me. The difference between you and the unbeliever outside there is the presence of God that you carry. The spirit of God that is in you. Moses understood this so profoundly. He had to cry to God. In, in, in Exodus chapter 30, he said, say, Lord, without your presence, we will go nowhere. David in Psalm 51 understood this when he messed up and with Bathsheba and he was crying, seeing that the presence of God is about to he said, Lord, take not your presence from me. Because that is what made David David. That was what made David David. That is what makes you you. After all said and done, there are people who are far more intelligent, far more skillful, people who by if it were given by their own power can make heaven. But no, they can't. But you know, when the trumpet sounds, you will not need a ticket because you already have the ticket. You will be gone from here. What is that? It's the presence of God with which you have been sealed unto the day of redemption. Uh, if God breaks that seal and takes the presence from you, the Bible says, he who does not have the spirit of God. The spirit of God represents the presence of God. He who does not have the spirit of Christ is none of his. Have you read that before in your Bible? So it's a dangerous thing to move away from the presence of God. It's, it's a dangerous thing to, to, to avoid the presence of God or to be denied the presence of God. That is, that is your power connection. You cannot afford to be disconnected. So when you refuse to carry out your assignment God gives you, it in, disables you from connecting with God. And these things we don't sit down to think about, but this is the consequence of our failure to make ourselves available to God to perform the assignment he has given to us. So I want to say hallelujah. The second danger for non-compliance with God's assignment on your life is that it puts your safety into jeopardy. In Jonah chapter 1 verse 4, Jonah's safety immediately came into jeopardy. The ship in which he was traveling, running away from God, began to face the storms of the raging sea. Praise God. Why do we struggle with safety? I was at a place where a man of God said, and he was right. He said, you know, he was boasting in God. And, and some people who were sitting around me were thinking that he was just an arrogant fellow. Well, he was not. I knew I, it, it accorded with my spirit. I knew he was not arrogant. He said, Boko Haram, he lived in the north. He lived in Bochi. I mean, sorry, uh, Borono. Meduguri. Borono said Meduguri. He said, Boko Haram can never touch him. 
Because he's on God's assignment there. And he does them. I said, wow, this is it. This is it. And I sat there and I was thinking on that statement. And I knew he was saying the truth. Because if God sent you on an errand, on an assignment, isn't it God's responsibility to have you protected? Should it be your own own, own thing on how your safety should be secured? No, it brought home to me the point that safety is of the Lord. So some trust in chariots, some in horses. But what? We will trust in the name of the Lord our God. But you see, that trust in the name of the Lord our God will work for us when we are going about doing what he has asked us to do. Ah, I said this is true. There is something in law. It is called the law of thought. T-O-R-O-T. Now, that is that law that establishes what you call vicarious responsibility or vicarious liability. If I sent you on an errand and gives you my car and you're driving my car and you had an accident whilst you are going on the errand I sent you, whatever they say is on my head. Does that make no sense? Whatever happens there, I become responsible for you. Why? Because I sent you on that errand. That's why a staff working for a company will come into damages and the company will have to pay for it because it's a vicarious liability. That staff was carrying out his or her assignment at the time the damage took place. The staff cannot be held liable. Praise God. It's a company. Now, if you're doing what God asks you to do, why should it be that God's security apparatus will fail to protect you? So when you see Christians die needlessly, know that they were not on assignment. Isn't that powerful? I think that is something we need to think about as we carry on with our life. Lord, I'm going out this morning. I activate your angels. The eastern angels, the western angels, the northern angels, the southern angels. Let them take their place around me. Hey, hey, they are watching. Okay, where is he going now? Who sent him on that errand? Who, on whose assignment is? Who gave him that appointment to keep? It has nothing to do with God. They sit back. Because, you know, those angels... They hearken to the voice of his command, not your voice. Not your voice. Praise the Lord. Are you still here with me? The third consequence of non obedience, non performance, non compliance is it puts the safety and welfare of others with whom we deal, even though they are innocent, into jeopardy as well. Verse 4. Jonah was in the boat. He was not in the boat alone. When the storms came, because of him, was he the only one that faced it? Hello? Everyone in the boat with him, even though they had nothing to do with it, suffered the pressures. And you know what that brings to me? It affirms the principle of corporate responsibility. No man is an island. What you do or fail to do affects me equally as it affects you that's why we ought to be responsible for one another that's why you know we've talked about it here and again david messed up his children paid for it he was not the only one that paid for it his children paid for it. his family paid for it uh, dotan and abiram all those guys that stood up against moses in the wilderness were they the only ones that the earth swallowed up? No. Their wives, children, everything they had. Corporate responsibility. So whilst you are saying, no, I'm not going to, please, can you take time and look at all those that are around you, that this thing I'm being stubborn can affect not only me, but everyone that is connected with me. It's dangerous. And then, of course, Jonah became suicidal over and over again. Praise the Lord. 
But the good thing about God, and that's our prayer, is that God is the God of the second chance. Amen? In Jonah chapter 3 verse 2, the Lord gave him another chance. He said to him, arise, Jonah chapter 3 verse 2, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. When Jonah refused and tried to run away from God, and finally, in his suicidal attempt to totally run away from God, abdicate this responsibility, he told them, throw me into the sea. And the sea will be calm. That's a suicidal move. Hello? If when they threw him, God had not given him a second chance, by preparing, hello, the whale to swallow him. There was a divine ship or a divine boat that God prepared for him. If God did not do that, what would be the state of Jonah? He would drown. Our God is the God of the second chance. He gave Jonah the second chance. Jonah took it this time. He didn't try to run away anymore. He went to Nineveh. He preached to the people and the people repented. Praise the Lord. They declared fast and redemption came to the city of Nineveh by reason of his obedience. That is what we call willing obedience and unwilling obedience. When you willingly obey the Lord and carry out the assignment God has given to you, this is what happens to you. Because of your willing obedience, the good of the land becomes available for you to enjoy. This land is good. I am telling you, this land of Nigeria is good. There's a lot going on that many of us are missing out. Because, hey, if you are not working for God, why should God work for you? We pray, we cry, Lord, Lord, Lord. Hey, he's also crying and praying. Son, daughter, son, daughter, rise up, do for me. Listen to me. Listen to me. The greatest treasure of God is the soul of man. It is the soul of man. It is so profound. That's why God can take on the form of a man, came down in the form of his son, and gave his life just to get man back. It's the greatest treasure. Now, what has happened is, we've focused on the treasures we want, the gold, the silver. And you know, he says to me, son, the gold is mine. The silver is mine. Riches, durable riches, they all belong to me. He said, the cattle on a thousand hill, they belong to me. What do you want? The heaven is mine, the earth is mine. I can give it to you if I want to. But before I can give it to you, can you give to me what I want? The soul of man. The soul of man. His greatest treasure. The enemy has stolen the souls of man. And I confine them in the place of ungodliness. And God is saying, I have raised you as saviors upon Mount Zion. Go for me. Judge the Mount of Esau. The Mount of Esau is the world. Hello. The Mount of Esau is the area of carnality that in which we all operate Monday to Saturday. We go in every sector of life. We operate as his children. He says, I have put it there as authorities. People with power. Can you just save for me and then judge the mountain? In the mountain of Esau, there is wealth. In the mountain of Esau, there is prosperity. In the mountain of Esau, there is breakthrough. Everything you want, healing, deliverance, uplifting, everything you want. You have to judge it. But before you judge it, can you be a savior upon Mount Zion? Can you be a savior for me? Or save, give me the most important treasure I have that I have lost. And then I will give you the most important treasures you require. Isn't that a good deal? We just need to believe him. We just need to trust him. Child of God, if we willingly do that, the land will open up for us. But if we do not willingly do that, we will lose out. You know, Jonah 
did not willingly do it. He did it by conscription. Now, God just opened up the land to him. Under the sun as he sat back to see how God's destruction, even though he preached, he never believed that his preaching would be of any effect. But you know, the word of God is powerful. Whether you believe it or not, it can work. Listen to me. He sat, let me see God's wrath fall upon these people. As he sat back there, God from the land raised a God, G-O-U-R-U-D, God, whatever, to cover, a leaf came up to cover his bald head so that the sun would not beat him. And it brought him refreshing. He was happy. Oh, thank God. It was the good of the land. But listen to me, it didn't last. Have you seen believers who come to church, do as though they love the Lord, and God opens doors for them, and before you know, they go back to misbehaving, and the door shuts down. Hey, I told you the three seasons of life. There is the morning season in a man's life, the noon season in a man's life, the evening season in a man's life. The world is good world when you start in the morning and it, you end up in the evening with it. Hello? It is terrible when in the morning you are rich, in the afternoon you are rich, by evening you are so broke, you died a debtor. Jonah! He didn't do this thing willingly. God just showed him this is the good of the land you could have enjoyed. And then just when he settled down to enjoy it, God killed it. And Jonah was very angry. He said, why are you doing this to me? This small covering that you cover my head with, you have now killed it. I'm so, God said, Jonah, what's your issue? Why are you angry? I was the one that brought it for you. I'm the one that killed it. You, have, you played no part. You were not thinking about me. The souls that are about to perish, I created them. They are the most glorious treasures I have. Most important treasures. You didn't bother. So, now you're feeling bad over something you played no part in bringing up. Think about how I will feel when I lose my souls. Beloved, when we willingly serve our assignment in serving God, when we go out there and bring him his greatest treasures, the souls of men, there is nothing we ask that he will not give to us. Praise God. Praise the Lord. We all know one man called Archbishop Benson Edausa of blessed memory in this country. He came from a terrible background where nothing was available for him. Hello? He came to know the Lord and began violently to win souls for the Lord. He died a fearsome voice in this land. He died a wealthy man. I mean, I listened to one of his messages. He said he it took him 15 years to build his first house. But when he began to subsequently build, doing what God asked him to do, banks were competing with one another, bringing him money, so that he did not need their money to build the universities, the hospitals, and all the things he did. Money was available to him. This was a man who did not need visa to go to many countries. They made him a, a national, a citizen of countries where he had been such a blessing. This was a man who didn't need visa for people he was bringing into this country. He comes to the airport and says, they are with me. And everybody passes them. That's power. That's authority. That's the wealth of the land. Beloved, he was a no man when he began. But he died somebody. Why? He carried out willingly the assignment of God upon his life. Let's rise up. Say with me, Father. Everything that seeks to keep me from carrying out my assignment willingly, I command it cut off from my life right now in the name of Jesus. 
you want to pray that prayer from the depths of your soul. Everything that's contending against God's assignment in your life. Everything that is making you not wanting to fulfill God's assignment. Because that is the thing that is keeping you in the place of poverty. That is the thing that is keeping you at the place of affliction. That is the thing that is cheating you. So changing your life. Command it cut off from you right now. In the name of Jesus. Command it cut off from you right now. In the name of Jesus. Command it cut off from you right now. In Jesus. Mighty name we pray. I hear the Lord say to someone. I have brought you. Round the corner. It is your time now. To step in. Let that lifting. Become evident in your life. In the name of Jesus. I heard the Lord say to someone, fear not. Whatever it is the enemy has pumped up as fear in your heart. We drain it out right now. In the name of Jesus. Let the hand of the Lord rest upon you. Let his goodness become evident in your life. Let there be an activation in your spirit that will propel you to walk hand in hand with God. That the things he had ordained for you will become a reality in your life. In the mighty name of Jesus. May your desires be fulfilled. May your pursuits come to pass. In the name of Jesus. May everything that seeks to scuttle you, everything that seeks to scuttle you, your walk with God, fail in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. We'll give you praise and glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. This is the house of